This is for those who believe in the potential of science. Making brave choices, choosing to push the boundaries. This is why we believe in what science can do. Um, it's uh, a real challenge to follow uh, Dr. Fauci here to the stage, and uh, you literally will see uh, the sublime to the ridiculous. Uh, he is an athlete, a scholar, trained in the classics, a very well-rounded individual. Um, I'm only well-rounded because cooking is my hobby. <laughs> my education was that I went to MIT in 1970. Uh, I actually always knew I was going to become a scientist. Uh, my family urged me to go to medical school, uh, but uh, uh, I got a great deal to go to Columbia on a full free ride for a PhD. So I chose to do that instead, and so they stopped talking to me for several years until I married a physician. Uh, while at Columbia, I got a great break. Uh, the guy I was working with, uh, an excellent scientist named Jim Wexler, decided to move to the University of Utah. I had already completed all of my qualifying exams. Uh, so I could remain a Columbia student and uh, actually followed him to the University of Utah where I completed my Columbia PhD in three years working in what turned out to be a great department of biology at the University of Utah under the chairmanship of uh, Carl Gordon Lark, who was one of the, the great scientists I've ever met. Uh, after Utah, uh, my three years in exile, I returned to New York and uh, worked at the Public Health Research Institute with Richard Novick for almost 15 years, where I started studying bacterial drug resistance, uh, bacterial pathogenesis, uh, and basically trying to figure out why bacteria make people sick and how to make them stop. Uh, another great mentor of mine whom I first met in 1969 was Frank Talley, who I actually met in Vietnam. Uh, and Frank had been encouraging me to go into infectious diseases and eventually uh, in 1989, he asked me to consult for him at what was then American Cyanamid in Letterly Laboratories. Uh, and after four years of haranguing, I eventually worked for Frank uh, in Pearl River, New York. I stayed at the company that became Wyeth for, again, almost 15 years uh, before leaving Wyeth to go to Novartis as the global head of infectious disease research, before coming here to Gaithersburg uh, to work at MedImmune uh, as you heard Randy say, as the head of the Innovative Medicines Unit for Infectious Diseases and Vaccines. I said my family stopped talking to me until I married a physician. Well, in 1984, I met Mariana Nessen, uh, who was then doing a postdoctoral fellowship at NYU, who finished medical school at the University of California, San Francisco. Uh, and I actually can prove I'm a nerd because I met her at the Enzyme Club at Rockefeller University. <laughs> We married on October 22nd, 1985, and this was Valentine's Day this year. So we will celebrate, and I really mean celebrate, our 30th anniversary. Yeah. Um, I did get the girl, and nerds do rule. She's a nerd too, she actually works I'm proud to say in Dr. Fauci's organization at the National Institutes of Allergy and Infectious Diseases as a senior medical officer. And when she heard there were uh, Anthony Fauci playing cards, she insisted that I get some for her. She didn't ask for mine. So I, I think you just heard one of the great examples of the importance of infectious diseases and the incredible importance at preventing them. And so I'm gonna focus the rest of my career mainly on preventing infectious diseases because the best thing you can do for the sick people is not be one of them. What is the scariest virus in America? This was from uh, CNN Health and they came up with actually six different, different infections, none of them being Ebola, that are scarier to us here in the US and in North America than the Ebola that virus despite its high degree of mortality. And this was the list from them, including norovirus, which causes many schools, not to mention cruise ships, to shut down, HIV, that you've heard from Dr. Fauci, hepatitis C. All of these were on his complicated chart, showing all these infections. And that the one at the bottom is probably the one you've heard the least about, but is an incredibly common virus uh, called, called respiratory syncytial virus. Uh, 
And if I have time before the 20-minute uh, presentation's over, I'll talk about that. But what I really want to focus on is influenza. So as you can see from this particular slide, and by the way, I'm not shy about complicated slides, uh, and these are exactly the same slides I use to present to any scientific audience. And I think a key lesson for you guys is, if you're giving a scientific presentation, never dumb it down. Because frankly, your collective audience is always smarter than you are. So always show them all the stuff you've got and be honest when you don't know the answer to a question. But virtually all of you in this room have experienced influenza. Even with taking what sometimes is a very effective vaccine and sometimes isn't, you are going to get respiratory infections, common cold caused by human rhinovirus, other respiratory viruses caused by a wide array from paramyxoviruses to respiratory syncytial virus, but more serious infections which, which go from the upper airway down into your lungs, such as influenza, which can be quite threatening, but not, mainly not to the, uh, uh, an audience such as yourselves, which I'll show in the next couple of slides, but to older individuals and people who are immune compromised such as those with HIV AIDS that Dr. Fauci talked about. But you can see a very large number of hospitalizations, over 25 million physician office visits every year, uh, and 25 to 72,000 deaths. Put things in perspective. Because of the work done at the NIH and by multiple pharmaceutical companies, the number of deaths due to HIV AIDS is now less than 9,000 a year. More people are dying from the flu than die from HIV AIDS. That's in the US. Well, what do you know about influenza? This is a virus. It requires to it's required to infect a cell, a human cell, usually in your airway, in order to replicate, in order to grow and make new copies of the virus. It's an RNA virus, and it has what's called a segmented genome. That should not sound strange to you. You all have segmented genomes. You have 23 pairs of chromosomes. In the case of influenza, it has eight single-stranded RNA molecules, and that's one of the reasons why this virus is able to evolve so quickly. Notice the use of the word evolve. That is an issue we have to deal with in infectious diseases all the time. These organisms continually change, and that's why we have to be on the lookout for new forms of flu, not only that, but new kinds of viruses that can infect people. What's also interesting about influenza is its very broad host range. It infects not just people or animals, mammals, but it can infect birds. Uh, it can infect even reptiles. There are strains of flu that can infect virtually any organism in the upper end uh, of, the, you know, of the development. And you can actually get flu from animals. That is the concern about the so-called bird flu or swine flu. And the nomenclature we use, how we call out these viruses, is based on two surface factors that we find in flu. Something called hemagglutinin, that's the H component, and the other called norodminidase, or the N component. So when you hear H1N1, that basically describes a certain serotype that is a form of these proteins on the surface of flu that your immune system reacts to in a certain way. So H1N1, is a common human version of the flu. Most recently, it caused the pandemic that appeared to start in Mexico. Now, I apologize for discussing death so frequently, but frankly, infectious diseases, as Dr. Fauci just told you, is still responsible for 16% of deaths worldwide. And unfortunately, many of them are preventable. And if only we had a vaccine for stupidity, we probably would prevent more of them. What's interesting here on this chart is you can see that you guys are the age group, 2 to 17, that get the most disease. But the people who have the most mortality, the most deaths per age group, are those older than 65. So what does this actually mean? It means, frankly, that you guys are getting the flu, mainly because you haven't taken precautions, you haven't been vaccinated, you haven't been previously exposed, and then you give it to your grandmother and she dies. That's got to be a good reason for you to get vaccinated, because you're the guys who are getting the disease. But we'll discuss prevention later. As I say, it's a comp I, I'm sorry if I'm edgy, but I did say from the sublime to the ridiculous, so. 
It is a complicated and not a complicated virus. As I said, it had eight individual RNA components, and there are multiple types, which, because we're scientists, we start with A. So types A, B, and C, A being the one where we see the most disease and also the most mortality. And in fact, specifically, the H3 uh, version of hemagglutinin is associated with the most mortality in older individuals. And the, the life cycle of flu has been well studied, and because of that, we're developing newer and better means of both preventing the flu virus from infecting people, as well as transmitting the virus, and finally doing better jobs, going to do better jobs of actually treating the infections. But I'm not going to talk about treatment today just to let you know that the basis of our ability to beat an infectious disease is equal to our ability to understand its life cycle and where we can intervene with drugs, with vaccines, with other preventative precautions. So it's actually going to be left to you guys, not to Dr. Fauci and myself, to eventually cure HIV AIDS and prevent flu from being the worldwide pathogen that it is. There are many, many subtypes, and what I'm showing here is exactly what I told you previously. It can infect seagoing mammals and is responsible often for deaths of dolphins, porpoises, whales, etc. And it's very contagious there as it is with us. But the key message is that even though this virus can be transmitted from animals to people, that's rare and that's fortunate. But it does happen, and it happens with enough frequency so that eventually you get novel serotypes into human infectious flus that you don't normally see. <laughs> By the way, that's not me as a young child. <laughs> yeah, and it, if so this actually comes right off the internet. You guys can download this picture. And the funny thing is, I don't even think it's gross. I just think it's stupid. <laughs> <laughs> so you might have heard the term pandemic. You know, a pandemic would be a novel strain uh, as opposed to the strains that, quote, normally, unquote, circulate for years. Uh, when a single strain breaks out and becomes the predominant strain, especially if it's something that we haven't seen before, that's why we call it novel, you get these pandemics like the Spanish flu, in 1918 to, uh, uh, to 1920, which was coincident with the large movements of people that occurred during the First World War. And indeed, it caused more deaths than virtually any other infectious outbreak until the HIV AIDS epidemic uh, actually hit. The Asian flu, which uh, a, a pandemic that I lived through and was infected by, was actually a, a very severe influenza. And again, not many people had seen that particular type of flu, which means they had no natural resistance because of prior exposure. Beginning 68, 69, we're getting better vaccines on the market. Uh, I think a large reason why the H3N2 Hong Kong flu outbreak was not as serious as it could have been was actually the ability for us to begin vaccinating against the flu. And then finally, the most recent swine flu outbreak, uh, again, a much lower mortality because I think we reacted much more quickly in terms of actually aggressively vaccinating the populations. So this is actually going to be my last slide on influenza because there's something you guys can do, aside from becoming scientists and figuring out how to do my job better than I do it, which I'm sure that many of you will. Number one, get the vaccine. Not only are you the guys who get the flu at the highest rates, you're actually the people that respond best to the flu vaccines. You actually produce the best immunity, better than even kids in college, and certainly better than the elderly who don't respond well to the flu vaccine at all. And even when it's not 100% effective, it is likely that you will get a degree of protection so your illness will not be as severe. And of course, if you like your grandparents, you don't want to spread the disease to them. So therefore, even if you get sick, you should be practicing good hygiene at all times. If you get sick, number three, don't go to school. Stay at home. Any type of respiratory infection can easily be spread. And I'm being very inconsistent here because I had a crappy home life. 
use that word again, Liz. Uh, so I went to school every single day from junior high school through high school, whether I was sick or not, and that's not good for my fellow students, and it's not good for your fellow students. So you're, you get sick, please stay home, and please make sure your parents are aware that that's the right thing to do. Also practice good hygiene. Wash your hands regularly. The way you transmit flu is you touch a surface or you touch, you know, touch, you know, touch somebody's hands, shake hands, then you go to your nose or your eyes, and the nose and the eyes are the root of flu in. You can get it through aerosol, but it's most likely you're gonna get it through physical touch, which means when you blow your nose, don't blow it into your hands, make like Dracula, and blow it into the crook of your elbow. So don't get other people sick, it's kind of, and don't get sick yourselves. But if you wash your hands periodically, when you do touch your nose or your eyes, there's much less of a chance you'll be transmitting uh, influenza that you picked up from surfaces or in the air. So very simple messages. Uh, if you do feel ill, you know, we're getting better at rapid diagnostics. There are therapeutics that in general you won't need if you get the flu. Uh, but as we make better diagnostics to more rapidly determine if you've got the flu and better drugs that work against the flu, then that's when you actually want to get tested for it as quickly as possible because the drugs have a window where they work and then they don't work any longer. So the quicker you get it diagnosed, the better it'll be. But I'm counting on you guys to find the next generation of preventions and treatments. So now I'm gonna talk about a virus you haven't heard much about, and only in a few slides. And it's another respiratory virus called respiratory syncytial virus. And I believe these slides will be available. Uh, all of these are virtually available online as well. Uh, it's a less complicated virus than influenza, uh, and as such, it does not evolve as much. So the strains are relatively constant from year to year. There are two major surface glycoproteins that are proteins that have sugars on them. One of them has been effectively targeted with a novel monoclonal antibody to prevent RSV disease in high-risk babies. So there is a prevention for this, uh, but in general, there's been years of search for novel vaccines for respiratory syncytial virus. To date, we don't yet have an effective one. This is what the healthcare burden of this particular virus is. And I'll show you uh, some more data in a few subsequent slides. But the riskiest population to get this disease are low birth weight babies who are less than 32 weeks of gestational age. And Indeed, you can see that hospitalization and lower respiratory infection for this population is pretty high. Uh, babies who are near term, but still a little bit premature, are the next highest risk group. Uh, and finally, healthy babies, uh, all the way up to five years of age, are those who are, remain susceptible if they haven't been infected previously and developed immunity. The highest risk group are newborns, where we get an exceptional number of ER pediatric visits uh, in zero to five months of age. And as you get older, there's less susceptibility to the virus and also less serious disease. This is an interesting publication that came out at the beginning of 2013. And basically what it says is, quite simply, in the first three months of age, the hospitalization rate of all babies is nearly 5% due to respiratory syncytial virus, which is as much as all other hospital, vi hospital visits combined for people in this age group. So various approaches are being used now, such as actually vaccinating moms who are pregnant to see if they can transmit the immunity to their kids, developing novel monoclonal antibodies that I described, that's work that I'm currently doing, but also active vaccinations for infants as well. All of this is ongoing, uh, and again, it very well might be left to you to actually come up with the final solution for respiratory syncytial virus. And this is where we are in 2015 with this particular virus. The bottom line and the last line on the slide, the NIH has been working on this aggressively for many years. Uh, Metamune has been working on this aggressively for many years, almost since its founding 26 years ago. Multiple companies are looking for vaccines, multiple academic groups are looking for novel approaches. Uh, 
Clinical research, as Dr. Fauci said, is what we all actually live for, preventing that next infection. In my case, since I'm dedicated to prevention, I can't tell heartwarming stories of patients going home from the hospital. My joy is when people don't get hospitalized in the first place. And I want those people to be you. So I thank you very much for your attention and enjoy your life in science.